Here in Wisconsin, before the white men arrived, were the Indians. Chippewas were in the north. Sacks and foxes roamed in southern Wisconsin. Along the eastern part of Wisconsin lived the Winnebago, while across the land, along the Mississippi, were the tribes of the Great Sioux Nation. Flags of three nations have flown over Wisconsin. Jean Nicolet, a Frenchman, first saw Wisconsin in 1634 and claimed the land for France. French did not settle, but came to trap animals for furs, as well as establish missionaries. In 1763, England gained this land when France lost the French and Indian War. The British established new forts and strengthened the old ones built by the French. At the end of the American Revolution in 1783, Great Britain gave the United States all the territory east to the Mississippi River and north to the Great Lakes. Britain failed to live up to her agreements and continued to hold the forts and monopolize the fur trade. After the War of 1812, Britain was finally forced to withdraw her troops and give up this territory completely to the United States. The Northwest Ordinance of 1787 provided for this land north of the Ohio River. At one time or another, we were part of the Indiana, Illinois, and Michigan territories. Wisconsin became a separate territory in 1836. In 1848, Wisconsin became a state. responsible for the establishment and growth of Rhinelander. John Curran, Rhinelander's first settler, left his home in New York State in 1852. His journey took him to Chicago, Janesville, Madison, Portage, and Stevens Point before he reached Merrill, which was called Jenny then. In August 1857, Curran helped Peter Kramer, whose nickname was Dutch John, take a canoe load of supplies up to the Eagle River. They traveled up the Wisconsin River from Merrill and had to portage in several places. Their first real rest after the strenuous journey was at the junction of the Pelican and Wisconsin Rivers. They probably explored the land on both sides of the mouth of the Pelican River. Kern liked the spot. He couldn't forget it, and two years later returned and built Halfway House, a training post. Men of vision realized the great forest of northern Wisconsin would bring many settlers here. Logs could be floated down the Wisconsin River, 
but tote roads were also slashed out of the forest by the early loggers. These paths were necessary because the loggers needed a road over which to tote supplies to their lumber camps. Another early settler was Martin Lynch. He was born in Ireland in 1820. When he was about 19 years old, he migrated to Canada. For two or three years, he trapped the lakes and streams of Canada, living among the Indians. Word spread among the tribes that there was good trapping along the Wisconsin River. When the tribe decided to move from Canada to Wisconsin, Martin Lynch moved with them. It is believed the journey took two years. They probably arrived in this area in 1845. It was during this period that Lynch met and married an Indian girl, a Chippewa. Her English name was Ramona, but the Indians called her Gishkanakwotakwi. She never learned to speak English. They built a cabin about two miles south of the junction of the Pelican and Wisconsin rivers. Other members of the tribe, mostly Chippewas, stayed around the same area. Unlike Curran, Lynch preferred to live the life of an Indian. In fact, he was often called the Indian Man. He never made an effort to identify himself with his own race. We know Curran and Lynch knew each other quite well. In the late summer of 1870, John Curran told Martin Lynch that he planned to go to Wausau to marry Lizzie Sloan, a 20-year-old Irish Catholic girl from Canada. After a simple ceremony, they returned upriver to Halfway House, where Martin Lynch and a group of Indians welcomed them. Lynch's wife Ramona was one of the welcoming party, but she was too shy to meet the new Mrs. Curran. Ramona, with other Indians, had just returned from a trip a few miles upriver where they had harvested wild rice, while the Indian children gathered cranberries from logs close to the river banks. A few weeks later, Ramona sent Lizzie Curran a gift of wild rice. In the following years, the Curran and Lynch children were playmates, along with other Indian children, they attended the same school which John Curran built. The first teacher was said to be a relative of Curran's from Canada. Martin Lynch lived out his life on the Wisconsin River, but in 1900 John Curran decided to move to the state of Washington. Again he was a pioneer. Few men achieved the title of pioneer citizen in two such widely separated communities. In December 1912, the New North, the first newspaper in Rhinelander, printed this description of the site of Rhinelander written by an early settler, Eugene Shepherd. Away back in 1870, A. A. Weber of New London rescued the writer from a job on a farm and made cruiser, cook, compass man, beast of burden, and canoe man of him. After traveling up this Wisconsin River to Eagle River, we returned and arrived at what was then called Pelican Rapids and camped on the Poplar Grove Point at the mouth of Lake Creek, where Tolman and Conroe built their sawmill. In 1872, Anderson W. Brown, called the father of Rhinelander, first saw the future site while on a cruising trip in the interest of his father in the Stevens Point Boomage Company. The fine water power at Pelican Rapids and the great log storing capacity of the body of water since known as Boom Lake were instantly apparent to him. Millions of feet of pine, hemlock, and other timber covered the land. In 1874, the Browns and A.T. Anderson purchased about 1,500 acres fronting both sides of the Wisconsin River and around the lake from the state of Wisconsin. The Milwaukee, Lake Shore, and Western Railroad began construction of a line from Milwaukee to Lake Superior in 1878. Rhinelander was then called Pelican Rapids. The Browns worked out an agreement with the railroad to build a spur from Monaco. The town's name, Pelican Rapids, was changed to Rhinelander in honor of F.W. Rhinelander, the president of the railroad. 
The first train arrived in November 1882. Browns transferred their business interest from Stevens Point to Rhinelander. They built a large sawmill about the same time as the firm of Tolman and Conroe, who came from Oshkosh. In the year 1883, an excellent crop of potatoes was grown on the spot where the county courthouse now stands. Much building took place in 1882 and 1883. A small portable mill worked steadily to saw the lumber for the building boom. After living in tents, men were glad to find rooms at the Rapids House, which occupied the spot where the federal building now stands. No saloons were allowed on the railroad or on any of the Brown Brothers' property, but so much land was owned by private companies and the government that it became difficult to control the sale of liquor. Gene Shepard wrote, A man who was badly in need of strong liquor, or more correctly, who wanted it badly, could get it at the Frost Hardware Store if he exercised due discretion. He would sneak off by himself to the store, open the door under the stairs, and step inside when Mrs. Frost was not looking, and draw a glass of something in the liquid form that tasted like corn juice, make a deposit of ten cents on the head of the barrel, or make his own change from what he found by the dim light of a lantern hanging on a nail, listen very quietly for customers in the store, and then step out quickly and leave the premises like an honest man. Rhinelander was governed under the town system as a part of Lincoln County until 1894 when it was chartered as a city. Finally it was decided to discontinue prohibition but strict control of hours or saloons was enforced. The Brown brothers again gave away half of their landed possessions in order to bring the Sioux Line Railroad here. It was then known as the Minneapolis, St. Paul, and Sault Ste. Marie and Atlantic. The line ran from St. Paul to Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan. It reached Rhinelander in November 1886. In June 1893, the Milwaukee, Lake Shore, and Western was changed to the Northwestern Railroad. A new city has many firsts. In 1882, the first post office was in a tent with T.H. Powell as postmaster. Mr. Devoyne, the second postmaster, had the post office in his store. When W.L. Beers was postmaster, the post office was in Seidel's clothing store. In those days, the postmaster was appointed by local officials and not the federal government. January 1st, 1896 a municipal waterworks was put into operation. The present city hall was built in 1908 and 1909. In the fall of 1889, E.A. Forbes installed an electric light plant. The Oneida Gas Company was established by Dr. Alfred Daniels in 1907. The Rhinelander Telephone Company was organized in 1901 and began business that year. Education always received careful attention in Rhinelander. The first one-room school was built in 1883 on the present site of the junior high school. The enrollment was 18. John Curran was clerk, Casper Foss treasurer, and Charles Chaffee the director. St. Mary's Hospital was located on the present site of St. Mary's School. Doctors Daniels and McIndoe sold it to the sisters of Dolores' mother, 
who still operate our modern hospital on its site overlooking the Pelican River. The Merchant State Bank Building housed our first library. In 1903, Andrew Carnegie gave Rhinelander money to build the present library. In 1890, Arthur Taylor established a beverage company, which is still run by the Taylor family. Deacon Tibbetts of Anigo preached the first sermon in the spring of 1883 in a building across from the Rapids House. Father Bouchel of Anigo was the first Catholic priest. The Congregational denomination was the first to build a church in 1886. All denominations used this first church, a custom of pioneer towns. The only original church is the old Swedish Lutheran Church located between Thayer and Mason Streets. It is interesting to note that the people of Scandinavian descent settled the north side of Rhinelander because they worked in the lumber yards. Many people of French descent made their homes on the west side. That area was nicknamed Frogtown. The old county jail was erected in 1888 and 1889. It was a cooling off place for the lumberjacks after their fighting and drinking bouts in the hollow that portion of Thayer Street adjacent to the Sioux Depot. The coin shop on Davenport Street is the original city jail, one of the few landmarks left of the early days. The Browns received a charter for the Merchant State Bank in 1886. The first national bank received its charter in 1890. Dr. A.D. Daniels was responsible for its organization. The Rhinelander Savings and Loan Association organized in 1900. Arthur Taylor and E.M. Kemp were first temporary officers. Their first loan was made to a woman. The first newspaper, dated December 7, 1882, was The New North, established by Charles Barnes. A bucket brigade was the only fire protection. Each citizen constituted himself a fireman. In 1887, at a meeting of citizens, two volunteer companies were organized. In 1893, the department was improved by the addition of a hose wagon and horses. In 1896, a horse-drawn hose wagon carrying short ladders, hose, and chemicals was purchased. In 1904, the city bought a hook and ladder truck. In 1911, the volunteer system was abandoned and 10 members were put on regular pay. Rhinelander was no stranger to forest fires. In 1904 and 1905, forest fires swept the north side. The October 4, 1905 fire destroyed two churches, two schools, and the lumber yards from Boom Lake to Thayer Street, in addition to numerous homes. One man reported that he had seen a woman in a state of shock, carrying, of all things, a corset, the only possession she had saved. The most trying period was in September 1908. The New North reported under a headline, Situation Most Threatening. Last Sunday afternoon, the air was filled with smoke and cinders, and the flames fanned by a strong wind reflected in the sky with a radiant glow. So discouraging was the outlook that a meeting of citizens was held. It was decided to seek outside assistance. The Milwaukee Fire Department was called on the long-distance phone. An engine and two horse carts left the city on the Northwestern Railroad and arrived here that night. Only the arrival of a two-day rain saved the city. The fires of 1908 were widespread, endangering such cities as Marshfield, Wausau, and Eagle River. In the latter, families were waiting at the railway station to be evacuated. At the fire's height, the smoke was so dense that people walked around with wet towels over their faces. As in Rhinelander, many Eagle River residents resorted to prayer to save them. Another strong personality of early Rhinelander was Eugene Shepherd, who was one of the best known pioneers of Oneida County and served for years in public office, being practically the first register of deeds and long a member of the County Board of Supervisors. In character, he was quite eccentric, and one of his practical jokes has come near making his name immortal. This was the construction of a monstrous looking animal with immense claws and great spines on its back, which he called a hodag, claiming that he and one or two others, 
who were in on the secret, had captured it among some rocks near Rylander in 1896. Representing it to be alive, he kept it in a sort of den, where it could not be examined too closely, and by a system of wires could make the animal move, while at other times it was heard to utter weird howls or terrifying growls. It has been claimed that P.T. Barnum was fooled by it, which is not impossible, as he was not a naturalist, and in any case would have cared little what the animal was as long as he could have fooled the public with it. The hodag made a great sensation. But to the people of Rhinelander, the hodag is more than a hoax. It has become a local legend. It is the symbol of the city, Rhinelander, the home of the hodag. The mill was built on swampy ground with big slough holes next to the Pelican Rapids because of the water offered there. April 1904 saw the mill in operation. 150 men were employed in 1904, working 12 to 13 hours a day for an average wage of 15 and one half cents an hour. In 1917, the mill started three eight-hour shifts. The Rhinelander Paper Company scarcely had been in operation a year when it was sadly noted that the age of the lumberjack was passing. Rhinelander, the once great center of the hectic logging days, was becoming tame. No longer were the streets lively with the antics of the colorful woodsmen. Instead of swinging a husky arm to cut down trees in the woods, the men were moving indoors to work on wood in the mills. On December 31, 1904, the Rhinelander Herald ran the following nostalgic editorial. The lumberjack is passing. The state is getting along in years. With the lumberjack goes our youth in the woods, as with the unbroken prairie goes our youth on the plains. The common laborer is taking the place of the woodsman, just as the prosaic farmer has taken the place of the cowboy. The lumberjack was a fascinating type of man. He came very near to being the natural man. His passions were elemental. He worked hard, fought hard, drank hard, and enjoyed every minute of his life. He was a skilled workman with none of the tameness of the settled trade. He was wild, rough, and free. He was the frontiersman in the woods. He enjoyed his open-air life and crude but hardy fare. He would rather ride a log down the river and get an advance in pay. Nothing in the world seemed worthwhile to him except life in the woods and on the drive. And now the veterans that are left are leaving for the Pacific Coast and the lumberlands of the South. Good riddance, your peaceful city man will say, but for those who are able to appreciate the roughness of life, the loss will be real. The Rhinelander industry, most closely connected with the Rhinelander Paper Company, is the Daniels Manufacturing Company, which specializes in printing on papers, such as those produced by the paper firm here. Found and incorporated in July 1915 by the late Dr. A.D. Daniels, the firm at first was engaged in the converting of tissue paper into napkins and the manufacture of crepe paper products. The company actually was formed to make use of the tissue then being turned out by the paper firm and the company pioneered in the crepe paper napkin business. The company was located in a plant on Thayer Street on the Sioux Line right of way for the first 10 years of its existence. Rhinelander has always appealed to people as an ideal vacation spot. Our story has been one of the days here before World War I. We are grateful to the Rhinelander Daily News the Public Library, Ruth Newman and the Rylander Paper Mill, and the many friends who donated their private collections of materials of early Rhinelander history. Besides the names which this account mentions, many names which appeared in the early records are still to be found here. Omelia, Kelly, Steele, Taylor, McRae, Richards, Morrill, Calkins, Korth, Swedberg, McDonald, Carr, Mahoney, Jeffries, Robbins, Abendroth, Melria, Gilligan, Hardell, Ashton, Lewis, Reardon, Hildebrand, Harrigan, 
Gilday, Houlihan, Powell, Briggs, McIntyre, White, Gibson, Sutton, Hagen, Shelton, Strobe, Hack, Nixon, Lytle, Lally, Olson, Strangstad, Anderson, Nelson, Wold, Packard, Moon, Didier, Anderley, Finlan, Cole, Parker, Pankritz, Perkins, Cushman, Goodagast, Post, Brager, Caldwell, Bentley, Ponce, Pierce, Cable, Hilgerman, Burns, Pride, Edmonds, Kennedy, Van Pay, Robertson, Hergren, Rod, Cretlow, Schooley, Jude, Sheik, Dean, Gleason, Leonard, Counter, Paulson, Wright, Peterson, Dahlstrand, Schliesman, Moberg, Seibel, Remo, Levine, McDermott, Horn, McKeachin, Stevens, Henry, Doyle, Vaughn, Gary, Keenan, Kirk, and Nolan. Eugene Shepard, creator of the Hodag, wrote his version of the Round River Drive. This presents an end to our story. The Round River Drive. Twas sixty-four or sixty-five, we drove the great Round River Drive. Twas sixty-five or sixty-four, yes, it was during of the war, or it was after or before. Those were the days in Wisconsin, the good old days when any man could cut and skid and log and howl, and there was fine enough for all. Then all a logger had to do was to find some timber that was new beside a stream. He knew it ran to Wausau or Marcusan, that at that place a mill there was to take the timber for the saws. In those old days the pioneer, he need not read his title clear to mansions there or timber here. Paul Bunyan, you've heard of Paul. He was the kingpin of them all. The greatest logger in the land, he had a punch in either hand, and licked more men and drove more miles and got more drunk in more new styles than any other PV prince before or then or ever since. Paul Bunyan bossed that famous crew, a bunch of shoutin' bruisers too, Black Dan MacDonald, Tom McCann, Dutch Jake, Red Murphy, Dirty Dan and other Dans from black to red with Curly Charlie Yellowhead and Patsy Ward from off the clan. The kind of gang to break a jam, to clean a bar or rossle rum, or give a twenty to a bum. Paul Bunyan and his fightin' crew in 64 or 5 or 2, they started out to find the pines without much thought of section lines. So west by north they made their way 100 miles until one day they found good timber logging land with roaring water close at hand. At last, a hundred million feet in, twas time for driving to begin. We broke out rollways in a rush and started through the rain and slush to drive the hundred million down until we reached some sawmill town. We didn't know the river's name, nowhere to someone's mill it came, but figured that without a doubt to some good town twould fetch us out if we observed the usual plan and drove the way the current ran. Well, after we had driven for at least two weeks and maybe more, we came upon a pyramid that looked just like our old forty did. Some two weeks more and then we passed a camp that looked just like the last. Two weeks again and then another two that looked like our camp came into view. Then Bunyan called us all ashore and held a council as of war. He said with all this lumbering, our logs would never fetch a thing. The next day after, Silver Jim, he had his wits scared out of him. For while he's breaking up a jam, he come upon the remains of Sam, the man who'd made the great ascent and through the cookhouse ceiling went, when Pink Eye grabbed the failed tin and put the blastin' powder in. 
And then we realized at last that every camp that we had passed was ours. Yes, it was then we found that the river we was on was round. And though we'd driven for many a mile, we'd drove in a circle all the while. And that's the truth as I'm alive about the great round river drive. What's that? Did ever anyone come on that camp of 61 or 63 or 65? That year we drove the great round river drive? Yes, Finn Lowler, Tom Doyle and me, John Moon and some two or three of good and truthful lumbermen came upon that famous camp again. "'Twas west of Rhinelander, fifty miles, "'where all the face of nature smiles. "'We found the place in 84, "'but it had changed some since the war. "'The fire had run some summer through "'and spoiled the logs and timber too. "'The sun had dried the river clean, "'but still its bed was plainly seen, "'and so we knew that it was the place for of the past. "'We found a trace that a peavy logger knows so well, a peavy marked with circle L, which you all know was Bunyan's mark. The hour was late, it was getting dark, and we had to move. But there's no doubt it was the camp I've told about. We eastward went, a corner found, and took another look around. Round River, so we learned that day, on section 37 lay.